Hello, come in. Oh, please don't get up, Mr. Crawley. I, I was just wondering if you meant what you said the other day about um, showing me the run of things. Of course I did. What are you doing now? Notifying all the tenants that in celebration of Maxim's return with his bride, this week's rent will be free. Oh, was that Maxim's idea? Oh, yes. All the servants get an extra week's wages, too. Oh, he didn't tell me. <laughs> Can't I help you? I, I could at least take the stamps. Well, that's terribly nice of you. Uh, won't you sit down? Oh, yes, thank you. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Elena Moretini, who is the director of Globant's Sustainable Business Studio. Welcome to the show today. Thank you very much. So, Elena, tell me about yourself and your background. Uh, yes, I'm a geoscientist. I'm a woman in STEM, a geologist by background with a PhD in geochemistry, which actually makes it uh, relevant and easier to uh, uh, face all the topics about climate change, being a geologist with a with chemistry embedded in, in, in my expertise or in my skills. And I've been working in the energy industry for about 20 years. I have been acting as vice chair for the United for the European Union, uh, shaping the scientific area for the union itself in partnership between academia and industry. And uh, landed in Globant in November last year where I became the director of uh, the sustainability studio and initiatives that they're they created passing through a quite relevant step on energy transition. So I have been leading the uh, B20 task force on energy resource efficiency and sustainability. And that was my transition out of the energy world into the energy transitions into sustainability. You know, I, I love your background. And, and by the way, one of the things is, um, you know, I'm preparing for another presentation, another speech. And one of the slides that I had prepared was that, um, you know, in the last not even two years, we had companies like uh, Chevron, Texaco, Mobile in kind of the top 10 of S&P 500 and how those companies have dropped off the radar from the listing of the top 10 S&P 500. And you have new companies like Tesla and others has taken over. So we're definitely seeing a lot of changes within the oil and gas industry. So I wonder... By the time you were transitioning out, what were some of the things that you were seeing? And I wonder how they're uh, perceiving uh, the necessity to adopt the likes of hydrogen as well as other forms of renewable energy. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very passionate about all this topic of energy because I think that is key actually to, to the planet in absolute terms. So um, I have... I have a thinking that goes all the way through energy transitions to the renewables and hydrogen assets that you're mentioning. I think that first of all, we really need to realize that uh, there is a lot that we can do in greening the energy industry. And that is particularly important and relevant at the moment because we can still not do without uh, natural gas and without oil, we can phase out carbon definitely, but the other fossil fuels are still in the need of transitioning. So what we really need to impose in terms of regulations and general culture is, and business, of course, is that all those companies, all the energy companies that are still have assets based on fossil fuels do actually produce energy at uh, almost zero emissions. This is something that we can do. I mean, we go to Mars, there's definitely something that we can do about capturing all or the majority of the emissions that we produce while producing oil and natural gas. So uh, it is absolutely relevant that uh, the cultural change within those industry not only makes them drift and shift towards renewable and new type of energy, including hydrogen, as you said, but also makes them produce oil and gas that is still needed within this transition and within this next 10 years until 2030, lowering their emissions down to almost at an absolute zero level. Yeah, I, I actually like this conversation because I think sometimes when we speak with those that are just simply just, you know, it's all or nothing, 
I don't understand the, the nature of the complexities, right? So for example, in the case of manufacturing supply chain, there are a lot of pieces. I mean, let's take even an electric vehicle, for instance. I mean, there are many components that's going to be petrol-based, plastics and you know, other type of composites and, and resins and so forth. So it's, you know, to completely go cold turkey, it's just not realistic. And there needs to be a, a transitional period. Uh, and also the solutions that can come up to speed to substitute or replace those things in a scalable, lower marginal cost fashion. So there's a lot of issues to, to resolve. Uh, on the topic of hydrogen, I wonder what are your thoughts there? Because, um, you know, it's one thing to generate it from clean energy, but to store it and then transport it and then distribute it across the likes of Europe, South America, North America, it's not a trivial thing, is it? It's not a trivial thing. I'm not an expert on hydrogen, but I'm passionate about hydrogen being the most common element in the universe and also thinking that as scientists, it's possibly one of those elements in terms of combustion that we still do not fully dominate. So it is very important that we keep on trying and that we keep analyzing how to produce clean energy through the different stages of, uh, of blending with hydrogen. So absolutely fundamental that we prepare the entire natural gas network to be prepared for the mix because the mix works and the mix can can really represent the alternative for the future. Let me just clarify, I totally agree with you on the point that everything is complementary, so we cannot be absolute and, and eliminate one or the other. We really need to have uh, uh, an orchestra and, 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 a, and, a, and a very well uh, interfingering um, uh, proposal in terms of energy because none should exclude the other and we really need to look at the geographies the demograph demographies and the possibilities that we have to blend in all different types of energies and also I think that um, there is what you mentioned about the elements I have been developing a few I think new ideas in this respect while in Globe and in the past months um, because I think that coming from a lab I think that the lab is a very healthy uh, working method and the lab teaches us that we can produce things in a lab. So at the moment, the entire electric market and the entire clean energy market is based on some elements that may not have the cleanest way of being mined or the cleanest way of being produced. So in this respect, anything that we can synthesize in a lab through technology, and this is also the relevance of working for a technology company, but at the same time, using the way of working of a lab, which is the trial and error, and finally the, the, the validation uh, of, of the whole scientific process is fundamental because we really need to get around those critical elements and we need to be able to synthesize probably even better elements if we want to go ahead and foster a clean energy industry. Because for the way we are based on natural uh, critical elements, it's going to be very difficult that we can actually um, we can actually uh, produce all we need for uh, the enormous momentum that the entire electric market is, is actually living through. So we really need to focus on how we want to support the basis of this new market, of this new electricity, of this new way of producing energy in respect to the way we mine those fundamental elements. I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this conversation because it's it's much more, I think, at a deeper level than in some of the other guests we've had. And, and the reason I'm enjoying it is um, there is a lot of chemistry, a lot of uh, molecular aspects that, that goes into battery storage uh, technologies. And, you know, whether we're talking about lithium, iron, cobalt, or other types of precious metals, they all have different implications, both from a mining to your point and the externality cost through the mining, but also the way we manufacture them into different cells and units and systems, and then the end of life in terms of recycling. But let's pause here for a second. Uh, let's go back to your day job here a little bit. First, tell us a little bit about Globant for those that are less familiar with the Latin American development base that uh, serves the US as well as the UK clients. And of course, have a very large footprint within Latin America as well. Yes, Global, Global is a global, com global company by now, global technology company, native technology company. And it has been very interesting for me to join such a dynamic environment in which the technology that you produce can be put at use of sustainability and climate change crisis. So in that respect, the end-to-end -end spectrum that Global covers in um, in helping clients reinventing themselves through digitalization and technology is, I think, a fundamental part to support all the reinvention and the, the new lens that we have to 
uh, look through for business under uh, the angle of sustainability and climate change and climate crisis. So in that respect, a technology company, a digitalization company is already sustainable in, in its uh, uh, DNA, if I may say, because digitalization is a sustainable process in respect to previous processes. So if you can also do that through a DNA of green IT or um, uh, technology for green business, that it's my everyday work at Goldman, it's something that really can uh, can uh, emphasize and can actually reinforce all the sustainability messages that we want to pass along for supply chain, value chain, um, the entire spectrum of industries and clients that have to go through this reinvention of their own business through sustainability. So in that respect, possibly technology and the technology that Globant leaves day by day is contributing very much to the decade of action that the United Nations have actually uh, stressed out as the period that we have left in order to try and be able to uh, mitigate and solve the enormous climate crisis that we're living through. All right, so I wanna get into a bit more kind of pragmatic aspect is that, you know, let's say, you know, at the higher tier, like the likes of McKinsey, for example, that are working more at the strategy level, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the BCG, the, the strategy and whatnot. Uh, they're thinking through really kind of at a higher overarching framework that then, you know, gets cascaded down through an entire organization. For Globant and specifically the sustainable business studio that you're overseeing, are you guys looking specifically within business processes that are touching technology, IT department in particular? You may also like our quarterly Astro Perkins event that brings some of the most notable experts and category leading startups in their area of sustainability and human survival on earth and in space. To register, visit astroperkins.com forward slash events. We are, uh, I think that, uh, I, I hope that this is the, the correct way to answer your question. Uh, I think we have a very holistic offering in this respect. And, and this is because we do the content of sustainability and climate change through technology. But of course, we do also the basic and building blocks of technology need to be sustainable. Because as we know, everything is, we can digitize everything, but everything also has a carbon footprint, including the digitalization itself. And this is where I think that it's particularly interesting to be able to offer a, a um, sustainability services for our for our clients, uh, McKinsey style as consultancy services, embedded in technology that comes along and accelerates the process and also finds creative and disruptive solutions for any type of client at the different stage of maturity in which they may be. Because as, as, as of course, you know very well, uh, not everybody is facing the same phase or the same steps or the same situation in terms of a of sustainability and the approach to sustainability. So I think that um, Globant at this very moment in time through the studio is, is really able to offer an end-to-end -end, uh, solution or proposal to clients and, and that clients and partners. And, and that can be very much amplified by all these uh, resources of technology that, that we can count upon. So we have, we think the thought uh, leadership in terms of uh, twinning digitalization and sustainability, but at the same time, so that, that is the strategy of a company because you do not have to do your journey of digitalization and uh, sustainability transformation twice. You can twin it and do it all, all at once, save time, resources, and of course, footprint. And at the same time, use all the technology that you have or that you can actually create or, or disrupt to adapt uh, uh, those solutions to the clients or the partners that are looking for a step farther in sustainability. I Let me just uh, emphasize one very simple concept. I think that it has to be very comparative in respect to where we were. So we can do uh, any company at any size of company can do even a small step. The important thing is that we move from where we were previously. So as long as we move on in terms of sustainability, depending on, on our possibilities and our intentions and strategy, that is what everybody needs to do. Just move on from where we were before and advance in terms of uh, energy efficiency, decarbonization and sustainability overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, you know, just to be clear for those that are listening uh, to be able to actually you know, take something very practical away is that uh, the the heritage of Globan is really an offshore or development house, right? So you're not going to be working on 
financial capital structure, for instance, you're not going to be working on the carbon tax credit per se, or the actual development of new physical assets or products. It's really the process improvement and then the supporting layers of technologies and the data underneath that. Is that correct? That is part of, of, of what we're doing, but there is a lot of content, especially in the part of uh, uh, climate finance and, and carbon crediting. We're really helping clients trying to build all their entire roadmap that we call roadmap 51 to zero, 51 mi meaning the gigatons more or less that we're emitting per year at the moment, going to the pledge to zero by 2050 or whichever age or whichever year they, they establish through all the means that we have. And there is a strong content background in this, uh, which is, especially from my point of view, I'm trying to uh, foster and, and advocate and push the entire sustainable finance and climate finance aspect all the way to carbon crediting, because we think that that is the way to complement the entire process. And then, of course, you can specialize with, uh, with different type of industries, but having the idea of embedding everything from CO2 taxation all the way to mitigation within your process, at least having that seen and having that mapped out as a process is something that we contribute through technology and through knowledge for our clients. And technology in that respect is everything that we can do for uh, carbon digital twinning. So mapping the entire process that helps actually getting to uh, a carbon neutrality or a, a net zero race and all these processes that we know are particularly relevant for um, basically developing a sustainable business today. Yeah, I wonder how some of the, the kind of the existing large cloud players, you know, like the, the likes of Amazon, IBM and um, you know, Microsoft, for instance, are thinking through how to bolt on new capabilities uh, like the ones you're talking about into their existing platforms. And then mm -hmm. new players that are coming up and creating uh, a whole suite of, uh, suite of platforms and applications to trace exactly some of these things, including you know, aggregation of metadata, sensory data, and other things that feeds into their, uh, essentially the, the reports, the impact, 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 and, uh, impact and ESG uh, commitment reports and, and, and metrics, for example, so versus those that are looking for more customized you know, solutions specific to their industry or at the, at the organizational level where you guys come in? Um, well, I think that, um, first of all, I think that cooperation is today the term that should accompany any sustainable uh, new measurements and, and measures and, and strategies. So I think that in that respect, we are part of consortium and, and sharing knowledge and, and, uh, and basically working together, many of the companies that you've just mentioned, because uh, everything which is di digital today, in any case, needs to be uh, traced in terms of carbon footprint. So we are evolving uh, together and uh, there, there is, of course, competitions, but there is always cooperation in that respect and trying to make this uh, um, sustainable digitalization advancing as fast as possible because as we said we all know that we breathe under the same atmosphere and time is very short so we need to be able to solve the time commodity and the co2 commodity through technology at every level and stage of cooperation invention reinvention within all the uh, devices and platforms that you've mentioned so in that respect we know where we are um, mutually and we are advancing in terms of digital sobriety mainly in terms of digital sobriety and green IT strongly everybody so that all the clouds and artificial intelligence and algorithms and neural networks are actually produced at the moment under the lens of green IT. Um, but uh, hopefully uh, everybody will integrate different products into these platforms because it is very important, not, not of course that everybody does everything, but that the entire life cycle of what we mean through sustainability uh, has to be under the eyes of clients and partners so that we can actually envisage the full journey all the way to the compensation of the emissions that we're actually producing coming from whichever company we are. So I'm going to come back to the digital sobriety that you referenced, but I want to go specifically to um, something that we found within uh, within the Sustainable Business Studio, where you where the the, the site uh, page indicated that the organization talks about helping with tools and know how to build their climate roadmap in favor of just transitions and climate actions. Absolutely. I wonder what exactly that means. 
Well, just transition, I'm, I'm particularly fond of the just transition mechanism, which was part of the energy transition initially uh, back in 2018 during the G20 of Argentina, where we basically came all together from different industries, writing this human centric uh, transformation uh, in terms of transition that needs to leave nobody behind in terms of stranded assets. So that is where the just of the just transition mechanism is actually very important and, and, and very relevant. And um, in respect, so what we are trying to do is actually having a sustainability approach, which not only encompasses the ESG parameters that are absolutely sufficient in terms of uh, making a company sustainable, but we're trying to um, make visible this new models of companies and of business that are actually based on sustainable business. So somehow we try to have a holistic approach um, under very many different angles, including, as we said before, climate finance, all the way to diversity and inclusion, because we think that that is the new sustainable models of business and that is the new legitimation of business. It needs to be done holistically, including all these parts together. And of course, you specialize in one, as you said before, but you need to have the entire picture under your scrutiny and under your view. Otherwise, you run the risk of uh, concentrating in one aspect of sustainability, as you could do for the agenda 2030 and basically uh, disregarding others that will become automatically less sustainable. So it, I think that it is particularly important, even for a technology company, to have all this uh, 360 degrees approach to sustainability in order to be able also to accompany and reinvent uh, the business of your clients, uh, making them aware of Awareness is very important, uh, awareness and readiness of this whole entire new opportunity in front of them. You know, I think it's uh, easier said than done. I mean, this notion of holistic, I mean, it's the way it should be from a, a kind of a, you know, normative versus positive statement. However, many organizations and firm specific level, you know, make decisions based on profit versus cost, right? So uh, you take the example of utility, utility industry, for instance, they're not driven by efficiency, uh, even performance to an extent, they're driven by, by policies and regulations and particularly penalties, for example, or lawsuits. So how do you go about this holistic approach when either at the industry and the firm level, there's just kind of that resistance, you know, they perceive it as a cost center rather than a, you know, new revenue center. Don't forget to visit astroperkins.com to register for our next quarterly events. Past and current speakers include Damian Vaughn, former NFL player, Neil Gregory, Chief Thought Leadership Officer at the IFC World Bank, and many more. To register, visit astroperkins.com and click on events. Uh, there, there is definitely a cultural change which is needed there. I always try to look at things uh, and suggest to look at things from the opportunity point of view. This, this revolutionary path towards sustainability and energy transitions and technology transition is a great opportunity, is the new economy. So you really need to look at it as the opportunity that you have at the moment to finance your business. You will have access to way less finance if you're not in, uh, if you haven't done all your homeworks in terms of climate due diligence. So there, there is actually an aspect of, of financing of your own business that will become, and it is already now, nowadays, we've seen it from, from the actions of very many and different governments at the moment. There is quite a big amount of money available there for those industries that want to make this transformation and want to participate to that. So of course, there is a cost, of course, there is a resistance, of course, there is a um, an attrition and there is also a, a sort of frozen, we call it frozen middle management that is not taking on board these new changes. But at the same time, we need to show the enormous opportunity behind it to move on economy to different type of models. And from those opportunities, the business will, will uh, proliferate in a different way. It may sound like a very optimistic and sort of naive speech, but there are, there are very many financial and economic uh, um, basis at the moment to know that the real stranded business will be the non-sustainable one. So it is time to 
take that step further and declare transparently your number, maybe even admitting your mis previous mistakes with a very uh, transparent attitude, declare them, uh, have them on the table and put forward the strategies that will rely on financial and economic support to be solved. And, and I think we're definitely seeing that momentum within Europe, for instance, whether it's kind of the general EU bloc and certainly kind of the Nordic region. There's just a lot of momentum that's, you know, transpiring into policies and then into capital and to the very things that you're talking about, green bonds and other things that really, uh, you know, gets at the weighted average cost of capital uh, per, per, uh, to your point that affects the equity and the, and the debt equation of, of, of companies' corporate finance aspects. Um, now, Europe, of course, is kind of leading a lot of this effort, but I wonder how that is from a reality on the ground within Latin America. Um, at the time of the G20, I calculated that there were more or less about five to 10 years of delay in other parts of the world in respect to uh, the transitions that were, were occurring in, in, in Europe. I think that the pandemic, if it has one positive aspect or aftermath that we can consider is actually the speeding up of everything which is uh, which enters the realm of sustainability. And that is true everywhere in the world. So definitely Latin America and other regions of the world may not be as advanced as Europe, but they have the advantage of being able to leapfrog and make that jump easier taking products that are already being proven from the shelf and take them on board as best practices with um, saving of time that today, as I said before, it's one of the most important commodities that we have in this transition. So um, if I were to define the situation in, in the Latin American region, I can say that the status is that of awareness, but somehow I have been very surprised to see how behind other regions of the world are in respect to the awareness on sustainability itself. The energy industry in, in very many developed countries is actually still very reluctant in, in, in understanding and taking on board uh, different measurements. So I think that uh, all in all, it is so much into everyday life now, all the issue of, of uh, climate change and, and crisis and sustainability, that Latin America is will be able to, together with other regions and emerging economies, will be able to make that jump and and uh, and eagerly absorb the best practices so that actually the time time can be saved in making that transition and i see it every day with clients in in, in latin america so it's not just a, a wishful thinking is 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 the reality it's very promising now you mentioned before this notion of digital sobriety and i wonder how do we reconcile what the company claims in terms of carbon footprint reduction relative to some of the other areas where maybe there's, you know, we talked about materials and the live recycling issues. Uh, so for example, many of us are users of heavy users of cloud, for instance, and data centers are just massive hogs when it comes to electricity uh, to mm -hmm. the point where Microsoft and others are looking at placing data centers in the ocean where you basically need to cool it less as an example, using the, the thermal aspects. Yes, well, of course, be. <laughs> Sorry. Or the electrification that requires all the storage and the storage and the lithium and other, you know, precious metals have to come from somewhere at the cost of those local regions. So how do we address some of these things? Um, one single answer to that would be, to me, a full life cycle assessment. And what, when you mean that, you basically trace everything in terms of what you're doing and your activities from the beginning, end to end. So end to end, full life cycle assessment, understanding where is your energy source, where is it located, what elements is actually, what materiality is actually using to understand the entire supply chain and value chain of every action or products we, uh, we materialize and we produce. So that, that to me is one answer by saying that we cannot look at partial or segments of this value chain. We really need to analyze the entire, um, the entire um, from, from the energy supply all the way to, to the end product. Our life cycle assessment needs to be absolutely thorough and complete. Now, having said that, of course, there are very many different actions that we can take, geothermal energy, where we can place actually our, our storages and data centers. There, there's many actions that we can take. But going back to the digital sobriety one, which is particularly dear to us in Globan because we are devoting um, intellectual effort and time to uh, try and produce energy efficient, not only devices, applications, processes, as we said before, and 
Um, even if the technology industry may not be one of the most uh, carbon intensity one, of course, it's it's very much, uh, it's, it's very democratic and it's very widespread. So of course, there are emissions very much related to every activity in terms of technology and digitalization. So we really need to pilot and track down KPIs of energy efficiency for everything we produce in terms of technology and digitalization. By doing that and comparing products, we will be able to choose the product that we know will have the least energy consuming or energy intensity KPI. We know very well that 60% of, uh, um, of emissions come from the energy production. So as soon as we are able to reduce energy consumption, we are able also to reduce emissions. So in that respect, we're really going far, far, farther and, and strongly and thoroughly um, advancing in our findings on, on digital sobriety, which basically means uh, trying to produce all our IT products by consuming less energy and tracking down those KPI of energy consumption as much numerically and in a quantifiable, quantifiable way as possible. Well, it's been a real pleasure having you on our show. Today, we've been joined by Elena Moretini, Director of Globans Sustainable Business Studio. Thanks for joining today. Thank you very much. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.